Elizabeth, hello. Hi. Thanks so much for uh, for coming on. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Awesome, awesome. Can you um let me just double check the chat here. Just add your levels. Okay, should be good. Awesome. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. This is a this is a topic I've been wanting to tackle with somebody for a long time, and you're the person to do it. So I'm really, really grateful that uh, you wanted to jump on. For this. So thank you for being here. Um, I guess just to get us started here, can you uh, just tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came in to covering sex work and traffic and misinformation and everything? Yeah, um, my name is Elizabeth Nolan Brown, or Liz. Uh, I am a senior editor at Reason Magazine. I've been there since 2014. Um, I'm also run a libertarian feminist group called Feminist for Liberty. Uh, one of my main beats at Reason since I started there has been sex work and by extension, uh, sex trafficking has, is a big part of what I write about too. Because when I started a Reason, you know, I kind of came at it from a very typical, I wanna write about sex worker rights and you know, adults should be able to do what they want with their bodies, you know, free, freedom of choice and things like that. And it very quickly became clear that you could not talk about sex worker rights in any capacity without people being like, but what about trafficking? Because, you know, this this idea that trafficking is epidemic in the United States and, and that we can't even, you know, consider decriminalizing prostitution because of it and things like that. So, um, you know, just to long story short, I started kind of researching that idea. And the more and more I researched, the more it became clear that actually so much of what people believe about you uh, trafficking in the US is not at all true and not at all like they think. And so that's also become sort of a major part of my project is is sort of debunking those myths now. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. And I, I feel relatively new to this whole thing as well, because I was aware of this subject. I mean, I was one of those people that was pretty misinformed for most of my life, and then started digging to, to, to the research more. And I come finding journalists like yourself and the work you do and being like, how is no one talking about this? It's so bizarre that like there's so much more access today to information, like good information out there. And it feels like this is one of those subjects where I don't know if it's in part due just to the fact that it's such a taboo or what, but it's like so many people are like willingly uh, just not wanting to, to learn the truth about like what's going on behind the issue. So it's, it's fascinating. I, I, I guess... For most people, like just to get us started here, I it would be cool to just from like a top level or as deep as you want to go, just to, for you to give us some history on um like the anti-trafficking movement in the U.S. for the past like couple decades, like how that came to be and like how this whole thing started as a culture war essentially. Sure, um, and like you said, you know the fact that this is so misunderstood is very deliberate it is a very deliberate product of this sort of uh, propaganda scheme or, or plan that's been going on for the past you know 25 years or so um but just to just to i guess sort of back up a second in case people aren't clear just to define some terms you know um sex work generally is used to refer to uh, all sorts of things all sorts of erotic industries you know it could be strip clubs it could be someone being a dominatrix it could be prostitution it can be things that are both illegal and legal in the United States. But generally, when we talk about sex work, we're implying a degree of agency, right? We're talking about consenting adults choosing to do this or, you know, um, you know, it's not always a black and white choice, but they're not being forced into it. Mm -hmm. When we talk about sex trafficking, um, it's either, you know, it's defined under U.S. law as prostitution or commercial sex that involves force, fraud or coercion or anyone who is under 18. And I think it's important to keep in mind that if someone is under 18, they're defined as a trafficking victim, even if they're doing it totally independently, and even if there's no force or fraud or coercion involved. Um, I'm not saying I think that should be legal. Obviously, we don't want underage people to be out there selling sex, and we don't want people to be allowed to um, you know, pay them or anything like that. But it also does help put some numbers in perspective sometimes that you know, if we're talking about a trafficking victim, it may just be a 17 year old who, you know, put an ad online and then started meeting up with people. It's not necessarily someone who is right. abducted and, you know, put in the back of a van or something. Well, to your point, yeah, it, it conflates. The problem is that it conflates the definitions so severely, because if you're a person under 18 willingly, you know, without any like coercion from somebody selling your body, 
and you're being lo like looped in as a trafficking statistic, that's not giving an accurate picture to the general public then, like as to you know, who are the victims here and like what's what's going on there. So that's like, so I was going to ask you that if it was like a intentional blurring of those lines or like how that all started, because it's so odd to me, I guess, like looking back over the past like 20 plus years, like you said, and seeing the sort of devolving of just bad statistics over and over and over again and like organizations having um like you mentioned the legal definition of sex trafficking but there's like all these sort of cultural definitions almost like people uh, just from watching pop culture like movies like taken like they have these ideas in their mind of what trafficking is and it just confuses the public so when like a study comes out and it says this many people are being trafficked each year it's like, well, what does that mean? So are you saying like kind of, I know we're not talking about like some cabal or whatever, but like broadly speaking from like a political perspective that this was sort of intentionally blurring the lines like early on or? Yeah, so in the 90s, you know, um, people might be familiar with the fact that in the 80s and 90s, there was kind of the porn wars and, you know, radical feminists, which just to be clear, does not mean like really, really feminist. It's actually like a specific school of feminist thought um, it tends to, they tend to uh, be very, very against all forms of sex work and think that no one can be doing will it willingly and that it's all, you know, if you say you are doing it willingly, you're just deluded by the patriarchy. This is right. the kind of Andrea Dworkin false consciousness school. Um, so, you know, they were very anti pornography in general and they kind of teamed up with Christian conservatives to fight porn in the 80s and 90s. And when that was sort of uh, winding down, their next big goal was prostitution and both um, making sure that prostitution stayed illegal in the United States and that it was punished more harshly and things like that. Um, especially because in the 90s, you know, there was a lot of, there was a burgeoning sex worker rights movement that was gaining more traction in the U.S. There were polls in the U.S. showing Americans mostly were like, oh, if it's, you know, between adults and it's in a home, private homes, like who cares? And they really wanted to combat that. So there's actually like documentation about these groups sort of getting together, this Rad Femme and Christian Right Alliance and being like, all right, how do we get people to not think that prostitution is okay? And it was, oh, we conflate it with child sex trafficking. Right. So it has been a very, very deliberate position. And when the first um, US, the first federal law dealing with sex trafficking was passed in 2000, there were several different coalitions and some of them were pretty good. You know, some of them were like NGOs or um, more liberal feminists who were just like, okay, like we wanna make sure we're dealing with exploitation, be it in the sex industry or in labor, just other sorts of labor. And, but we don't wanna loop in sex workers and we don't wanna conflate this, but pretty much in order to get the, you know, to get everybody on board, to get the conservative side on board too. And it was just like, nope, we've gotta do this. So it sort of turned out the worst of all worlds became what went into um, the law and became what went into the, the initiatives that started spawning up around this in the early 2000s. And it, it feels in a way that it's almost been like, it, like you mentioned, like they kind of like roped in like the child sex trafficking aspect of it. When I was growing up like 10, 15 years ago, when I heard about this issue in my mind, at least like the stereotype was like this, these are teenage girls we're talking about. And it almost feels like now with like a lot of the QAnon, Pizzagate style conspiracy theories that have popularized the past like year, especially. Um, it's like they're they're trying to make it like the the sort of imagery that they put in people's heads like more and more extreme. Like now we're not talking about underage teenage girls. Now we're talking about like literal children that are being you know abducted by John Podesta or or Tony Podesta or whoever is part of this like secret cabal. Um, and it's like really. It's so hard for me to wrap my mind around because in a lot of ways it has a lot of the same um, like feelings of abortion rhetoric or like people with the, the abortion topic often, not all the time, obviously, like the more inflammatory inflammatory ends of it will often, you know, talk about like how it's like murdering babies and like we're like in this war against, you know, there's like a mass genocide against babies. And when you hear, I think when like the, the common person like hears that talking point, like they go one of two ways, either they go, oh my God, that's so, that's insane. This is happening. Like how did I never hear about this? And they, they kind of get radicalized and, and move further into it. Or they just kind of like disconnect and they're like, well, that sounds crazy. Like I'm not going to even like pander to that. And it, it's really similar with like this whole child sex trafficking thing. Cause like either you hear statistics like oh my gosh there's hundreds of thousands of children being abducted off the streets every year and they're being sold into sex slavery either you hear that and you're like this is the craziest thing ever like how is this possibly happening or you're just kind of like that 
doesn't sound totally true. So it's it's such a difficult thing to navigate, I guess, like when, when you just hear the numbers because they're so inflammatory, it's so polarizing. Um, and I guess in part, that's why it's become so popular. But just like from your perspective over the past year, like as we've watched this subject get so, so much traction in the media, like behind the QAnon type movement, type movements, I should say. Um, is there any other like reasoning that you find like this point in time, like 2021 and last year, like f for this, uh, like the child sex trafficking issue to be spreading at the rate it's spreading, like and growing at the rate it's growing. Like, is there anything unique about this time period or culturally that is like causing this moral panic to spread at the rate it's spreading, like versus, you know, years ago or whatever when it was different? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if maybe conspiracy theories in general or it might be sort of on the rise. It seems like we're a little bit like in a, in a point where I don't know if it's like partly the pandemic and people just being, you know, out of sorts and out of their normal routines, partly just social media becoming more and more polarized and partly the Trump era, just, you know, having driven everyone sort of bad shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, yeah, I think that, I mean, that might all contribute to why it feels like more prevalent per se in the past year. But I also just think that like, this is the logical culmination of the past 20 years of intense, propaganda and myth making about sex trafficking put out by mainstream politicians on both sides, mainstream um, media, like, you know, CNN, New York Times, just everything on the left. It's very side. bipartisan. Yeah. yeah. And so like a lot of times now you have all these people who want to say, you know, all this media and all these people, especially like, um, you know, to the left of center who say like, oh God, like QAnon is just this crazy Trump phenomenon and who knows where it came from. It came out of the right wing fever swamp and whatever. And it's like, no, no, no. Like a lot of what they're saying is only one step further removed than than how untrue the media has been about this for the past 20 years. So I think you can't tell people. And like you said, it keeps escalating too. like it was like, oh, it's like this. And then it's like more and more like, no, there's just like children being abducted. Sexual. You can't tell people that for 20 years and then be surprised when some people are like, hey, yeah, I think that that's really true, you know? Right. I literally, right before we jumped on this call, I was on my, my personal Facebook, just fielding, there was like some comments on us doing this interview tonight. And that was literally an exact response someone had. Someone said, oh, this, because I was like, oh, we're gonna be talking about uh, sex, the issue, uh, issue of sex trafficking misinformation tonight. And somebody said verbatim, well, you know, it's really only gotten bad recently because of the QAnon stuff. Like, we all know trafficking is like this real issue. And I was like, that is literally like the sort of seed that starts this whole this whole problem is that it's like you're starting with misinformation and then building on there. Like, it's almost a, a happenstance, like moral luck that you don't wind up down that path just if you're basing like your same presuppositions off of bad information. So, yeah, it's a it, it's so different. And, and, I almost feel like I don't want to spend too much time on this because we can we could go forever on it. But I almost also feel like you're saying the past 20 plus years, there's been the sort of culture war element of it. You could even go back further. I mean, I'm sure you've talked a lot about this in your work, um, like to the in 1980s, like Stranger Danger and like the it's Satanic Panic. Panic. Yeah, ex exactly. So it's like this stuff, it really does feel like it's been so culturally ingrained on several different levels that you were talking about earlier, how there's this kind of intersection between um certain subsects of the feminist community and then the religious community and then the conservative community but then it when you hit the 2000s like it almost becomes this like we, there's the misinformation became like fact almost in the mainstream so now bipartisan politicians are like oh well yeah this is just an issue like we've we've all established it's true so let's just move forward with legislation which is wild to think that we've now been, over decades built legislation on top of it's like not not just built legislation but raised probably hundreds of millions of dollars at this point between private ngos and then public uh indus or public uh, institutions to fight trafficking when like the sort of premise we started from has been faulty from the beginning right right and yeah and the premise that we're that we're going after then the way we're fighting it is we're just throwing all this money at these these things that don't work because these things that we're throwing money at are designed to fight like 
hordes of sex traffickers de de um, descending on the Super Bowl, which is like <laughs> one of these big myths, or just stuff like that. You know, like we're, we're fighting it as if we need law enforcement to be doing all these things and busting down doors and stuff, when actually what we need is just like more shelters for, um, you know, victims of domestic violence and for runaway teens, because like, that's the way that trafficking happens in the US, you know, like it's, it, I'm not saying that people aren't exploited in the sex industry, but I, I've read so many cases about this, like all the time. And it's just, you know, it's a person who's in an abusive relationship whose partner then sort of starts saying, you've got to go out there and make money. Or it's like a, an LGBTQ teen who ran away and is on the streets trying to survive and is selling sex to get by and doesn't have anywhere else to go. And as we've been passing all these laws over the past 20 years, again and again, the question of like voting for more funding for shelters and stuff comes down. And the same people in Congress who vote routinely to do anything that involves more surveillance online, more law enforcement stings, and giving more power to Homeland Security and things like that, they never vote yes on like, hey, let's build some shelters. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, and I remember when I was first digging through a lot of the data on this, like one of the statistics that it shouldn't have blown my mind, but I guess it blew my mind because I was like, why is no one else who talks about this issue talking about it is the fact that like over 90 percent of runaways are like children are running away from abusive households which creates the circumstances for all of this and like it's one of those issues where when people talk about human trafficking like you're saying they want to kind of blame some like crazy outside force like these like pimps snatching children off the streets and they don't want to look internally domestically at the home or in churches or like in like intimate communities which is like where this stuff almost always happens by a family member or a, a friend or someone that they trust and that's like the most difficult thing for me i'm like wait this seems so obvious but how can we not like be addressing this as part of like the crux of this issue like like why kids are running away and like leaving their houses in the first place right they do this sting every year called Operation Cross Country, um, or they actually rebranded it a few years back as Operation Independence Day, but it's been going on since 2005. And the FBI funds, um, it's just essentially vice stings, you know, old fashioned prostitution stings in cities around the United States for like a, a month every year. And they call it a child sex trafficking rescue operation. And they arrest people for mostly just misdemeanor prostitution offenses, but also like driving without a license, run of the mill drug possession charges, all sorts of stuff. Then they tally up all the rests and they put out this press release saying a thousand people arrested in child sex trafficking operation. They don't right. list the charges unless you go, which I have for research for reason, go to each individual news article or police press release from each individual town and look at the actual charges. You can see that nobody's being charged with trafficking. Um, like this one year I looked at it, you know, there were ended up out of all of this, there ended up being only seven people arrested on federal charges. Um, none of them had to do with track. None of them were directly trafficking. A couple of them were the Man Act, which is transporting people across state lines for right. you know um, purposes. One of them was a guy who transported a 17 year old who drove a 17 year old to a motel room to meet a date. Um, he said he didn't know her age. She had a fake ID. She did indeed have a fake ID that was, you know, like realistic looking that said she was 19. Um, but regardless, the, the cops bragged about how they saved this girl. And then you read closer and they have saved her three times because she keeps running away from foster care. And the way that they save her is just returning her to her foster family. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know what was going on, but you think at that point, like, maybe this teen if this teen thinks that running away and selling sex on her own is better than being with this foster family what is going on there and why would you think that just sending her back to them without any other resources without any other effort put into it is is actually helping anyone you know and that's the kind of thing you see all the time in, in this sphere absolutely and like and i don't know that particular story but i imagine insofar as like this this tends to be the case with how the data is collected is that every single time then the police do that sting and they they pick up this girl that's tallied as another victim of trafficking so like one one runaway who might be running away 10 times in a year every single time they run away that's a new number in the trafficking database that they're they're keeping which is again it just it just blows my mind like when i was looking at this i was like man how is how is our data collection? I there's so many areas I guess like and I'm, I know you've covered like the war on drugs and there's 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 tons of um anytime you talk about like underground industries like of course the data is not as clean as you want it to be but I've never seen data collected so poorly and so just all over the place like it's like the definitions and how people are are um are, are counting like the bodies every time like in, in these cases 
And I was going to ask you about the um, like the sort of way journalists present, or any, I guess we'll just say the media in general presents uh, these trafficking cases. Like you kind of laid one out there. It's so um, interesting to me how every single time I see one of these big headlines, usually like the past year, that especially it's been trending on Twitter. Like anytime there's a quote unquote bust or you know big trafficking bust, and you read into the article and it's like it's kind of vague about the language. It's like, oh, we found a bunch of kids and and we saved them and so on. But then like you're saying, when you look into the actual reports, it's almost never the, uh, like the sort of stereotype that we're used to hearing about trafficking. It's always like this kid was running away and they could have been susceptible to trafficking. So we kind of counted them as trafficking. Like how, again, like, I guess from your perspective, so you're a journalist, like how do you interact with other journalists and other media institutions who cover this issue when it seems like almost every time a story breaks, it's broken so poorly. Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of what I do in general, in, in anything I've written about, like I used to be a health writer before starting at Reason and health writing is so bad, health journalism. And I think, so anything I do always ends up with an element of media criticism because every time you get to know a subject and then you look at the way the media is covering it, you're just like, oh God, like this is <laughs> It makes me right. really worry about the things I don't know deeply about because you're just like, that's <laughs> but, um, but no, yeah, I mean, it's it's really bad because they've started doing this thing too. Well, there'll do these stings and um, they'll be like, they'll just round up. They'll go looking for kids who are in the middle of custody disputes or kids who are things like that. Um, they know about them. They know about their whereabouts, but they'll do it all in one week. And then they'll have like maybe one or two people who were teens who were found having sex. And then they'll put it all together and be like 56 children found. And again, you go and you look at the press release from the police office or whatever, and you can find that most of these had nothing whatsoever to even do with the sex industry. And they're not even pretending that they do right. within the that, but they'll, but you know, they'll do a press conference or something and they'll say that. And the, the media is just so lazy about it. They're so lazy about it. Like so time and again, especially local news articles, but you know, they just say sex trafficking bus, sex trafficking ring, human trafficking sting, and they don't bother saying who was arrested, who was found, anything like that. Like, I mean, it's like you could go look and you could find these things and they just don't. They quote the police, they quote the police saying, we did this operation and then they'll find some local like charity that's like not in my backyard or something. And then they'll right. be like, have them give this thing like child sex trafficking is an epidemic and scourge. And then, but they don't give you any facts about the case. So I guess that's been, I mean, yeah, one thing I try to do is actually tell people what's happening in these things. And um, it's, oh, it can make a very, very small dent in it. But I have been, you know, glad that as I've been doing this, more and more people in like the national media who I know who cover politics and cover this sort of stuff have started a little bit to start like putting on their critical thinking skills with this. <laughs> yeah, because that's what I was going to ask. Like, how do you even compete at a sort of like national level when it comes to this, this type of misinformation? Because when I just log on to Facebook and look at my local, my hometown or whoever's posting about this kind of stuff, those are the stories that I think more so than really anything, um, maybe not more than like NGO statistics that get thrown around, but like, these like sting stories get aggregated over and over and over again. And it's like, I've, I've been in so many threads um, the, the past year where someone like yourself will, will be critically analyzing a story like this and say, hey guys, like this isn't what you think it is. You know, trafficking is not the sort of epidemic that we've been led to believe. And then like uh, always in the replies, there's like that one person who like Googled trafficking bust or sex string. And then like the first article that comes up is like the most recent popular police report. They, they reply, they say, look, look, it's like a real issue. It's like, how do you compete with that level of misinformation when it is just like over and over and over again and you're not getting the um, the sort of like critical collaboration from other like mainstream publications? Okay. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. We've got yeah. no answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, it's no, it, it does. It feels it feels like sort of a ridiculous task sometimes. Um, and also, you know, it's like I didn't set out to do this all the time. Right. Like when I first started writing about this reason, it wasn't like, like I'm like, you know, I didn't think like I'm going to have to routinely debunk these, but they're always there. And there's there's endless. I mean, I, I, I like the ones I get to end up actually covering is just like a drop in the bucket, like you said, of these things, because any day of the week you can Google 
trafficking sting. And it is, it's, it's definitely a coordinated effort by the NGOs and law enforcement because the way that they frame these is deliberately meant to mislead. And just, sorry, not to bring it back to Q, we're going to No, that's fine. But, you know, like you said, like, yeah, people are seeing these stories put out by reputable press organizations or ostensibly reputable press organizations every week saying that people are being caught in sex trafficking stings. Like, why are we surprised that they are believing one step further that there might be, you know, like an international ring of politicians involved or something, you know? Right. It's like the and logical end. Stories like Jeffrey Epstein, which just sort of, you know, really did happen. And that one was one that police knew about and just overlooked because he was, you know, a rich guy. So it's like, yep. it's not, yeah, you can see where they're getting this from. Yeah. And I think that's like a whole nother can of worms. Like when talking about this subject is, and I try to use this when I talk to friends or strangers <laughs> online about the issue to, as a kind of a, uh, like a kind of bridge to be like, hey, you know, like I'm willing to concede that there's obviously like when we look at cases like Epstein or like the Catholic Church or um, or even like we mentioned before, just like families in general. Like we, we do hear real stories about families, mostly um, families in poverty, like impoverished areas where like they sell their children for sex because like they're, they're looking to like, you know, get money or whatever it is. And it's like horrible, horrible stuff. So like we know. The stories exist. The pe- like the the victims are real in these cases. So like, how do you? Obviously, like I, we can use that as a bridge with a, like a conspiracy theorist to be like, look, we can admit this is real, but let's like take a look at the facts and maybe like narrow down into where more like re- realistic numbers are. But like on the other side of that coin, how do you communicate this issue to people who are victims of sexual abuse in one one way, shape, or form? Uh, when you talk about this, because like, I know a lot of cases, like you hear, like the very, the, the real victims often become like the sort of uh, figureheads of a lot of NGOs and a lot of um, reports that get done on this stuff. And it's so hard because, like, again, underground industry, a lot of what we work with are anecdotes. Anecdotes often sell to people. Like, if, if a victim of real sex trafficking has a platform and they're like, this is this crazy thing that happened to me, this crazy issue, obviously you don't want to demean that person's experience and their story but at the same time you have to be like yes this happened also we have to look at this in like the sort of broader context of data so like how do you personally navigate that uh that part of the conversation yeah i think it's important to never sort of say like you know yeah you're not trying to like if someone's talking about their own story you don't want to be like okay but this doesn't happen very often you know right but i think you know when you're talking about that it's important to talk about the best way to help people. And so like, that's the kind of thing I always try to say when they're like, okay, but this does happen. So how, you know, why aren't we, why aren't you okay with us doing all these things though, if it does happen sometimes, you know, if we save one child or one person. Right, right. And, and you know, the answer is that the way we, the way we do this, I mean, that's kind of what I said before. I feel like I'm repeating myself now, but the way we do this matters based on what the facts are. If there are tons of young you know girls who are being abducted and literally like chained to radiators or kept in you know cargo tins or whatever you see and take it and that sort of stuff like yeah you need a freaking SWAT team to like go in there and bust it down you need these like elaborate intricate law enforcement intrigue and stuff but I have yet to see in my seven years covering this now that ever ever be the case in any of these things we've done in the United States because that's not yeah you know what they're finding they're just going and arresting consensual sex workers for the most part so it's like that is not helping like we're wasting if you actually care about victims you want to actually help them instead of using all the money that you say and resources that you say you're going to help them to arrest consenting adults so i think sort of turning it back around i mean i feel like people on our side should actually have the moral high ground because we are the ones saying let's actually help victims instead of just taking all the stuff that you're saying is going to them and then using it to arrest a grown man and a woman trying to have sex with each other. But- right. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Like, I think a lot of it, like we're, you said earlier, <clears throat> repetition's good. This stuff's like, it, I need to get it ingrained in my head. I'm sure others do as well. Um, like in terms of like social safety nets and like, like resources, like ho- you mentioned homeless shelters and just getting more available resources, especially for like teenagers who are running away and young adults who are running away and, and don't have any kind of... Um, uh, social safety net to fall back on like that stuff is at least where my mind goes when it when I think of solutions to this it's like obviously we need more of these in place because the reason that these people are going into these circumstances is because they're coerced by their socioeconomic circumstances not by 
like an individual. Like an individual, and <clears throat> we can talk about this a little bit if you'd like. I know there's a lot of misinformation around pimps as well. But like, obviously, if you're a homeless young adult and you're on the streets, you've no no way to make money, and you decide, okay, like I'm, I, I have to sell my body. This is like I have to survive, like survival sex. If you're approached by someone who's like, hey, like I can like help you do this or whatever, that can easily, like we're talking about like the gray area here, that can easily become like a very coercive situation. But it's not coercive because the, the, the person is like forcing them in that instance, in this specific thought experiment. It's coercive because the socioeconomic circumstances put this person in this dire situation to where now where they're forced to make an impossible decision to basically put food on the table for themselves. So it's like, that's the hard part for me. It's like, how do you uh, like break through the taboos and the sort of like sensitivity of this topic to really get through to people? Like this is where the real crux of the issue is. It's it's people without resources that are feeling desperate and like, and cornered essentially to do this, right? And I mean, this is what's such a shame is because like you were talking about the victims advocates and unfortunately the only victims advocates who are pretty much allowed to speak in, in mainstream press or at congressional hearings or state house hearings and stuff like that are the ones who completely align with a very black and white government propaganda is propagandistic view of things and, and you know, are willing to say like, yes, we should never even consider decriminalizing anything between adults even because like that will be bad. Sex trafficking is rampant. You need to give cops more money to save people like me. Um, whereas there are actually tons of groups out there that work and do services for both sex workers, you know, sex workers who are, you know, doing it by choice and victims or who don't really make that distinction. Because I mean, I keep saying this because that's an easy way to, you know, talk about it as sex workers and victims, but mm -hmm. obviously, it's not a binary, you know, like, and a lot of people might have been a victim at one point and then they choose to do it or, or they might choose to do it and then fall into exploitation. Or like you said, they aren't like, I'm, you know, 100% with, with, you know, I have all these options and I'm just going to do this anyways. They might be doing it because they don't have any other options, but there's no one actually forcing them. So where does that fall? So yeah, it's, it's really, it's really much more nuanced than like victims and you know empowered sex workers and then victims who are just totally not but they don't really tend to let people or groups like that like actually have a say because that's sort of exact you know that ruins the narrative if you actually concede that this isn't such a black and white area yeah it, it kind of like it it, it it grays the sort of lines between making this a moral question and then a political question because obviously you put someone like that on a stage and morally everyone in the world comes together and says yes this is a moral wrong we all agree this thing is bad but then they kind of like bait and switch you then and they're like okay this thing is bad therefore we must abolish all you know sex work we must make it all sure. illegal or, or go like ahead that don't you know have to do with sex work i mean there's been so many things that we've passed that are just generally like surveillance oriented or right know, exactly oriented and people will just let them get away with anything because yeah like you say here's the moral issue we can all agree that's bad and then like well therefore it follows that we need to create this hero core within homeland security that monitors um that creates a facial recognition database based on sex worker ads and everyone's just like yeah yep seems like the next logical step <laughs> Like, we don't need to go from there to there, you know? Right. And, and, and like I'm saying, it's like, it's a, that's a whole nother set of political issues. And then there's also just the pure political issue of the sex uh, work industry right. in general, which is like, what leads to the best possible outcomes for the most amount of people in terms of legislation here? Like, is it decriminalization? Is it the Nordic model? Is it abolishing this industry? Like, what are the, where does the data point? What, what do we got going on here? Like, I guess... I didn't like want to jump this uh, this quickly into this, but we can since we're here anyway. Um, but like, let's I guess just for the people listening, like, how can you lay out in kind of like layman's terms, like the sort of uh, debate within this, within and outside the sex worker community in terms of like the the legal options to 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 between disc, disc, ah, decriminalization and then like the Nordic model, and there's all these different sort of ways to go about uh, making this industry. Yeah, so when, when we're talking about decrim within the sex work context, it's actually a little, I think it's actually kind of the complete opposite of, of when we talk about it sort of in the drug world context, um, because, you know, people wanted legalization for the most part, and, you know, that was the big goal within mm -hmm. you know, marijuana activism. Um, the, the vast majority of sex workers and sex worker groups that are, that are out there advocating for this um, want decriminalization, not legalization, because, you know, decriminalization says 
there are no penalties for adults consensually having sex and getting paid for it or you know doing doing any sort of erotic activity and getting paid for it um there could be additional things then that come after that like a, a city could say you can work in a brothel that is licensed by the state or you can get some sort of you know like city occupational licensing for sex work or whatever and if you want to do that and have this extra layer of you know regulate like you know whatever you can do that but you're not going to be arrested and thrown in jail if you're having sex for money outside of those circumstances whereas a legal system you know the legalization system that's still what happens you can have you can do sex work legally in a very, very narrow range of circumstances. And if you don't do that, you're still going to be criminalized. And you know, the, the reason that's just not great is because it still creates all the same harms of an underground, you know, of a, of a black market industry because you're still gonna have cops out there. And, and we do see this in places where it is like legal but not decriminalized. You know, you still have cops out there doing these busts. You still have very many people working underground and not being able to advertise openly and, and take all the precautions that you know, advertising openly can help you, you know, be safer and work with other people and things like that. And you have them not being able to do that because it's still criminalized. Um, Nevada, the very few counties in Nevada that have brothels, like that's a legalization system. And that's the closest we have to anything in the United States with it not being a crime. Um, then yeah, the other thing that comes in is the Nordic model or people recently in the US have been trying to brand it the equality model, which is super Orwellian when you know what the equality <laughs> model is because the equality model says that people who sell sex should not be arrested, but people who pay for sex should. And it's, it's sort of been it's being pushed by um like seth meyer the talk show host like his wife is a big advocate for it and you started oh. to get like a bunch of like celebrity like do-gooder celebrity acti liberal activists in hollywood who have like started pushing for the equality model um which they are like you know okay well you know we agree that it well it's sort of based on this premise this rad femme premise that no sex worker is actually there willingly so they have started you know so they would always say that well nobody's actually doing this willingly so then people would say okay, if nobody's doing this willingly, why are you arresting them? You know, right. you're arresting victims. And they're like, mm, okay, we won't arrest them. We'll just arrest their clients and anybody who helps them or anyone who like rents them a room or anybody who like lets them advertise on their website or things like that. So they're trying to pretend like this is actually a model that's more compassionate. And I mean, I guess, you know, it is, it is better than what we are doing. Technically, now. yeah, right, right. But like, it's still it's still no good as someone, it wouldn't make any sense if we were like, you know what, like you can buy milk at a grocery store or you can sell milk if you're a grocery store, but anybody who comes in and buys it is illegal. Like that wouldn't <laughs> mean that milk was legal. So it's just, it's sort of the same thing. You know, it's it's still criminalizing. If you're criminalizing people's clients, if you're criminalizing everything that they do ancillary to the, to the literal sex part of it, I mean, then they're not able to, again, they're not able to work safely. They're not able to take all these steps that would make sex work safer for both them and the customers involved. They're not able to earn a living in a, in a way without using exploitative middlemen and stuff like that, because they're still having to worry for, about cops and worry about finding customers on the down low and things like that. So. Right. Is there uh, any, I haven't like looked deep into these different models by any means nearly as far as much as you have, I'm sure. But like, is there any good polling or data to like support one over the other that like people are using? Cause again, I know it's like a really tough thing to quantify, but I'm just like wondering like you mentioned, obviously, like the thing that drives this conversation is the culture war aspect where you have like the sort of rad femmes who are like, no, it's all coercive, like, like get rid of all of it. And you have like the, the, the more sex worker positive people who are like, no, we need to make this more open and available to everybody. But like in terms of like legal or, or um, like the sort of like legal framework that you operate within, like, is there good data anywhere to support these things? Or is it kind of just like all up in the air and, and it's all about activism? Yeah, no, I think if you look at different, you, you look at different countries, you can get some idea. Um, you know, like New Zealand decriminalized completely uh, prostitution in 2003 or four. And so they've actually got a, a pretty good now sizable chunk of data on the outcomes. And there's been some very positive outcomes in terms of things like seeing a, um, a decrease in like STD rates, a decrease in self-reported violence against sex workers and, and sexual assaults against sex workers. Um, they've actually started where sex workers can get labor protections and like sue if they're being exploited, just, just like, like any normal sort of anybody in any other industry could. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot of positive data about decrim out of New Zealand. 
Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of negative data about the Nordic model or um, the equality model because it's been tried in um, Scandinavian countries and various European countries for now over, you know, over two decades too in some of them. And there's a lot of data to show that it doesn't work like they say it does. Um, that it's, you know, continually, like, there's not, for one, there's not the positive outcomes that we're seeing in New Zealand in terms of better, you know, uh, less sexual assault or things like mm -hmm. that being reported. And you still constantly see women being arrested for sex work because under the, that model still, it's like, if you work together with another woman, I, I'm sorry, and I'm using women, I know that not all sex workers are women. No, it's but fine. It tends yeah. to be very, tends to be very gendered. So, you know, they'll be like, if you work with someone else, then you are, um, you know, you're a brothel or you're a pimp or something. So they'll still be arrested. If you advertise, you can still be arrested. Um, migrant women are constantly being arrested under the Nordic model because they're, um, yeah, because I don't know why actually, but there's just a lot of data showing that that is what happens in, in places where it's been enacted. So I think that there is a lot of research showing that the Nordic model is not the optimal outcome. And then just in terms of if you look around the world, if you look at sex workers in movements in South Africa or um, in India or in Japan or anywhere in Europe or here or in Mexico, they're all calling for decriminalization. So I think that that's just something to take into account too. Like that might not necessarily be hard data, but the fact that like so many different disparate groups of people in very different cultural contexts and very different legal contexts are all asking for the same thing and saying that that is you know one of the slogans is like only only uh or rights not rescue and you know only rights can right these wrongs and stuff like that so i think that that tells us something too yeah no that's super helpful and I, that's why well, i was going to ask this at some point as well like i know you being intimately tied to this subject i mean where like if someone listening to this was like wants to learn more or whatever like where can people generally find like these sex worker communities i mean i know i'll obviously for, for obvious reasons a lot of them are anonymous and anonymous communities but um in terms of like kind of being able to parse out like the the, the sort of thought process on a lot of this stuff and where people stand on certain issues like are there forums or are there groups that you follow that you tend to get your information from yeah in the united states there's a lot of good sex worker rights groups um i mean all around but i'll, I'll talk about one in the u.s from sex workers outreach project or swap and also Swap Behind Bars are two of them. Um, the Desiree Alliance, the Red Umbrella Project, Coyote, Rhode Island, K it's all caps, it's an acronym for call off your old tired ethics. <laughs> um, the Erotic Service Providers Union, uh, I'm definitely missing some too. Um, there's a couple that have sprung up recently specifically around decriminalization, like one's called Decrim Now. Um, one's just called Decriminalized Sex Work. Um, my friend Caitlin Bailey runs a group that she just started called the Old Pros Project. And all of these groups tend to uh, be either very like a wealth of resources and research and stuff on their own, or they're always sharing the latest in it. Mm -hmm. Because um, like, and a lot of groups recently too, like outside of the sex work sphere have been taking this issue up, like Amnesty International and the ACLU and the World Health Organization have all come out for decriminalization within the past few years. And ACLU did a major report about it and studying outcomes and things like that. So I think if you look up, you, you know, if you just Google for some of that stuff for these organizations and look, you can find a lot of the research that they've done. It's actually been really exciting to see a lot of these like civil rights groups finally start to come around and give this issue serious attention and really put some resources towards getting better data because there's not a lot of great data. Yeah, it's huge. You'd, you'd think like these QAnon type conspiracy theorists too would be all for this type of things. It's like it gets everything in the open. So then it's like we can actually understand and collect more data and have a better picture of like a more accurate picture of like what's actually going on within these industries. I mean, right now it's like with everything being underground, there's that kind of like uh, pretense of like, well, we just can't know. It's all shadow industries and like there's all this dark stuff going on. But like if it was brought into a a um like a framework that was more able to have transparency and like and less uh sort of underground workings and yeah it'd be a lot easier to uh to kind of you know shed some sunlight on it and be like all right like let's see how big this issue actually is and like and what the issues actually are behind these terms so i i pulled up one thing that might be kind of interesting too is I know that you know the arrest and investigation numbers are not obviously a proxy for the total 
size of a, of a market in the United States, because obviously, you know, a black market, you're not going to be able to catch everyone. But I do think when you compare the numbers that the FBI or very, that state um, police report having investigated versus how many we hear, like, you know, these hundreds of thousands, it does put things in perspective. So um, in all of the United States, the police reported, this is from the FBI's uniform crime report. So, you know, they turn over the data to the FBI. Um, they reported looking into 1,883 potential incidents of sex or labor trafficking in 2019. And that, so looking into, this just means they opened a case file. It doesn't even mm -hmm. mean that, it, that it, you know, it was ever even substantiated. So less than 2,000 investigations even opened. And then 700 people were arrested. Again, this doesn't even mean it went on to be prosecuted or, or um, a conviction, but right. only 708 people were arrested for either sex trafficking or labor trafficking in the United States last year. And also um, in comparison, 26,713 people were arrested for prostitution, including 700 children. So I think that that gives us some idea of the scope. Like you have these people saying, and I know that sometimes people will counter like, well, we're just not giving enough resources. But if you realize the tens of millions of dollars and the countless hours and like just how much resources are going into this, there's tons, there's tons and tons. Mm -hmm. of tons. And if that's what we're coming up with is like this very little number, I'm not saying that like that that's okay. Obviously that's not okay, but that's more the scope of what we're talking about in the hundreds, not in the hundreds of thousands. And that umbrella is like what you said in the, the onset of this conversation, that umbrella is so many possible circumstances. Like you talk about labor, like, like, like human trafficking in terms of labor, like that could literally be somebody smuggling a family over the border and then they get caught. And then that's you, you are now a trafficker. You have human trafficked people, 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 you know, people that are picking, you know, they're agricultural workers who are getting paid, but not a minimum wage or who are getting paid, but have to work really long hours and things like that. I mean, yeah. And again, like, I'm not saying that these are things that we want to encourage or we don't want to like look into, but that's not, yeah. What, that's it's not different. What <laughs> and one other thing, like I meant to say this before when you were talking too, that, that distorts these numbers even further is that you have a lot of times a situation where when it comes to adults, if they are arrested in these police, sex trafficking stings, they'll give them an option. Do you want to be arrested for prostitution or do you want to say you're a victim? And right. so like when we're talking about the adult numbers, because then you look a lot of times, this is another clue. You look at these, these articles about it and you'll see that no one was actually arrested for sex trafficking. No one was arrested for pimping or pandering or anything related to like coercion or force whatsoever. But they'll say, oh, we rescued three adult victims. And you're like, well, then what, like, who, who was doing that? Like how you rescued them, but you didn't find anybody in, you know, whatever. And it's usually just because like, that means that they were adult sex workers. And they said like, we won't arrest you if you let us claim you're a victim. Right. And then they like send them, they give them the number of like some group that does like art therapy and that's it. And I know in a lot of those cases too, it's like when we talk about pimps being involved in all this, like at least from what I was researching a lot for one, I mean, it was only like studies and polls vary between like five and 20% of sex workers account for using pimps in the US. But of those, most that I saw were like, these are just friends or fellow sex workers that literally just drive them around to location to location or just kind of like wait outside of doors in case something goes wrong. So it's like, even like then, that's a whole nother issue where it's like, we know obviously somewhere there exists like the very real coercive pimp like like that's not like a it's not that they don't exist but the sort of stereotype being that like all pimps are this sort of like you know coercive you know they're snatching people off the streets versus like when a sex worker does get caught in these situations and then the police are like hey tell us you know who you're working with or whatever and a lot of times if it's their friend they're not going to be like here's like my friend's information, go arrest them. Cause then the charges for that person would be like w way more, right. Than like getting arrested for prostitution. Like, like pimping and stuff and, and pandering can be felonies. And, and again, yeah, that's what you like. Sometimes they'll do these things and they'll be like, well, look, people were arrested on that. And then you'll look and the person arrested for pimping. Yes. Is very often just another sex worker who posted, who helped their, like use their phone to post their friend's ad online because like the friend didn't have an internet connection. Right. Or, yeah, who gave them a ride to a thing. Um, that's why, we, yeah, you're exactly right that it is tricky because, you know, sex workers will talk about how when you see these things about pimps being busted and stings, it's often just them. 
And I've even seen cases where like teenagers, like you'll have two two people who are underage. Like um, there was this one case in Oregon and like there was like a 17 year old, two 17 year olds, I think. And they were working together. They were posting their own ads on uh, online and, and meeting clients. And then one of them turned 18 and they answered an ad for an undercover cop and they went to the hotel room and it, you know, it got busted. And because then the one was 17 and the one was 18, the 18 year old got arrested as a sex trafficker. Wow. So, I, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's so, it's such a tricky, but yeah, all of this to say, again, like, I, I think you handle talking and writing about the subject with a lot of grace because it is so tricky to navigate in terms of like people's sort of experiences and their assumptions and the sort of cultural overtones that, that kind of make this whole thing way harder to talk about and understand. So, it's really, it is so important to kind of dive into this and, and paint a more, nuanced picture for people when they're so used to getting that sort of binary like good bad from the media from from hollywood or whatever it might be um i guess but this has been great i really, really appreciate your time uh, we're coming up toward the end i guess we skipped over this and we don't have to spend a ton of time on it but like just to kind of close out there's a bunch we we alluded to this throughout the conversation there's like all these viral um numbers that get spread around by in a lot of cases by ngos themselves but i think more often, at least in terms of what I see, it's a lot of like Instagram influencers and you just see the stuff kind of shared in like viral Facebook posts where it'll be like 300,000 children are trafficked a year or um, like 800,000 children go missing a year. And it's like these huge, sometimes they're not even tethered to any study. Sometimes it'll literally just be like 1.5 million children are kidnapped. <laughs> like just, just stuff where you're like, wait, you Google the number. It's like, this number doesn't even exist. Like, where did they even get this? But can you, I guess, just quickly like walk through, um, like how do the, how did these numbers start to get aggregated and like, how do you, um, parse them apart? Yeah. Usually when you poke at them, you can find just this like really terrible maze of like one source quoting another source, quoting another source, but then it like comes back to, like you said, like, like somebody doing like a back of the envelope calculation based on almost nothing and putting it in like a flyer and then you know, putting that out and then like a local news uh, reporter like cites it in an article and then someone takes that article and reads it at a congressional hearing and then it's read <laughs> at a congressional hearing. So then, then you know, a more prestigious newspaper will quote it and then it'll, you know, wind up in Congress. I'm mean, Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post, he's their fact checker. He did this amazing report on one of these numbers and it was it was on like the State Department website and it had been quoted by like Amy Klobuchar and I don't know, several people um, in Congress. and. And all the stuff and then you actually found out like yeah it came back to some like disgraced ngos study from the 90s but they'd all just been sort of like been like well i got it from this website and well i got it from that website and it was <laughs> telephone <laughs> yeah and so, like the biggest one like you said the 300,000 children one this is um there's this guy richard estes who did this study in the 90s and said uh or it may have came out in the very early 2000s but uh it said you know 300,000 children are at risk of being trafficked so not that they were being trafficked, they were at risk. And the way it calculated if you were at risk was this huge array of things. Like if you were in foster care, if you lived in public housing, if you had like a parent who was in jail, I don't know, all these different things that pretty much just were like socioeconomic status. Right, care. right. And, and if you had more, if you were a child who had more than one of those things, they counted you twice. And then they like use this multiplier and blah, blah, blah to come up with this figure 300,000. So pretty much the thick figure came out of nowhere. <laughs> um the the authors of the study disavowed it a few years later they were just like yeah don't this is not actually a good study we don't think that you should cite this the national crimes against children research center which is like a prestigious group that, that you know um is funded by the federal government some and researches these things they put out a big thing saying please do not cite these numbers in all caps <laughs> and they still get cited everywhere and people say and it, you know it morphs too people will say 300,000 children are being trafficked not you know every year in the united states or you know it is just but none of it none of it is based on any bit of reality it's just like this guy calculating kids who were like poor or had like a bad family situation and in, in the whole united states and then saying like that so and pretty much all of them i mean there's like some about like the average age of entry into sex trafficking and again, you know, people will say it's like 13. You look at that, it's like, well, they're basing that number on a small study in San Francisco of like 100 sex workers in the 70s who were um, teens. Like they're being like the average age of teenage sex workers in the 70s. Is in a teenager. No, yeah, was a young teenager. But that doesn't say that, you know, obviously even the 70s is a very different climate than now, but obviously 
you're not accounting for all the people who don't start when they're adults. And some other calculations say that actually the average age of second and sex workers in their late 20s, if you're looking at the whole population of, of sex workers. Um, Maggie McNeil, everyone should look up Maggie McNeil. She's an amazing resource um, on this. Um, and in debunking these sort of things, she pokes around and finds where these original data comes from and sort of why it's just nonsense. But yeah, that's, no, that's great. Yeah, because there's just uh, the more I looked into this, there's all these like psychologists, like pop psychologists, and then there's celebrities like Ashton Kutcher who are just like they they share all this <laughs> this yeah it's like they share this misinformation and it's like it's just so again going I don't want to harp on it because I know you were like I have no idea what we can do but it's it's hard not to just think about like how we can combat this at a mass scale when you're like working against so many institutional forces and like how to frame it. Like you or I or whoever, like you only have so many, so much of a platform to put out good information. Um, and it's just so tough when you're like dealing with an onslaught of so many intersecting factors that are basically just shoveling bullshit into everybody's faces nonstop. And it's like, like you said, it's, it's a shame because I think if we had a more accurate picture of the problem, then you can come up with more accurate solutions. And like, when we look at these mass blown overblown statistics, like these 300,000 children are at risk or whatever, it's like, it paints this absurd picture. And I think people, most people, like I said, I think most people just check out, like most people see that and they're just like, okay, like, what do we do? Like, it's just another reality. Like, what are you going to do about it? And it's like, it'd be great if we can get people more activated toward like, legislators and media institutions to be like let's get this right because i feel like you you can I, we can end here but like have you noticed in recent years of you reporting like i know you said like other journalists have kind of been um been sort of uh getting better at covering this but have you noticed like from an ngo level from a government level like is there a, any kind of like positive trends where people collaborating toward fixing this or not really very very small um, I think that FOSTA was, which passed in 2018, the law that made it a, a federal crime to host prostitution ads, right, right, rallied such mobilization, like mobilized people so much and got so much attention outside of the normal spheres that pay attention to this, and actually got sex worker voices in there. That there are like very, very few politicians, like national politicians, who are questioning that. Like Ro Khanna is one of them. Justin Amash, who's not in Congress anymore, was one, but um very very few but that's more than there were i guess a few years ago so <laughs> two is more than there were a few years ago but the better the better stuff is happening at the local level um in in new york city in washington dc in um legislatures in like new hampshire and uh vermont and rhode island we're starting to see and, and new york state even um we're starting to see the introduction of decriminalization bills or at least bills to study decriminalizing prostitution and uh things like that so and because you know prostitution is not a federal crime so that is where this will have to change is at the state and local level and so if we can see that start to happen in a few places like that are trend-setting places like new york city or dc and there have been politicians there who have been very very good on this issue then maybe that can start to turn a tide yeah yeah it almost I, that, that's that's at least good to hear it almost feels like these issues are so annoying because you almost need like a cultural moment to kind of create the wave to get like you mentioned like with that legislation passing like to get everybody all of a sudden paying attention like oh my gosh like wait what is this thing like how is this going to impact my life my website whatever it might be um so that's like the tricky part i guess with all this is like figuring out like when these cultural moments happen how to ride that wave into getting better attention i do worry that it's gonna all that we're gonna backtrack under biden just because um people were willing to believe the worst about this issue under Trump because they, you know, believed the worst about Trump. So it was like, if you said like FOSTA is actually a bad bill, the way that the FBI is fighting sex trafficking is actually hurting people. A lot of just sort of centrist or, you know, progressive Dems, whatever, were like, oh, okay. Like, I, I will believe that, but like the Trump right. administration is doing this wrong. And I found people much more receptive, um, like in the mainstream, like center left, whatever space, much more receptive to my work during the Trump era. Mm -hmm. And I really wor worry that under Biden and Harris, like anything that they do is just gonna be like, well, they wouldn't do anything wrong on this issue. Like they're, they love women. And so, I mean, it just, it depends. Like maybe they'll get the memo, but I kind of, Joe Biden has a really bad history on this and so does Harris. And so I'm really worried that if like they do decide to, or if Congress does decide and they champion some new terrible legislation that there's going to be a lot less impetus to 
Well, like you said, it's like Trump had a similar effect on people as QAnon, where it's like it creates this like bad guy where everyone's like, oh, we all agree this is bad. But then when that goes away, it's like, well, there's still an issue underneath here. And now nobody wants to talk about it. And everybody just thinks it's fine. And yeah, and then people are deactivated from it. So we'll see, I guess. But I, you've been really gracious with your time. I really appreciate you you talking with me, Elizabeth. Um, is there anywhere you want to send people or anything you got going on you want to plug? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at E N Brown, and you should visit reason.com or feministforliberty.com if you want to see more of my work. Awesome. Really appreciate all the work you do and navigating this topic with such nuance because it is super complex. And uh, I, I think a lot of people listening to this will. I appreciate you having this very nuanced conversation with me. This is a really great conversation. So yeah, it's super, you. super important. So appreciate it. And uh, yeah, talk to you soon. All right. Bye. All right. Take day. care.